Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. discussion on two dimensional incompressible navier stokes equations so in the last lecture we had looked at different forms of navier stokes equations and uh, we have just written down one of the forms once again over here for recapitulation so it comprises of the continuity equation and then two components of uh, momentum equation and today we are going to discuss at length how to couple the velocity and pressure fields so <clears throat> last time we had finished our lecture by mentioning about a particular grid configuration called as the staggered grid which could be of use for coupling the velocity and pressure so before we go on to such a special grid we try to figure out what the problem is all about and then we try to discuss about the grid so let us look at a one dimensional grid over here comprising of these grid points which are equally spaced spanning from say i minus 2 to i plus 2 and then you find a control volume here around the grid point i and then you have the two faces of the control volume i plus half and i minus half now let us assume that at this point pressure and two components of velocity are all stored or located at the cell center location. That means for this shaded cell, uh, we have pressure and the velocity components at the center. And if you really want to have values generated at the cell faces, you would have to use some kind of interpolation. So this kind of a grid arrangement would be called as a collocated arrangement. And let us assume at this point that by some means a highly irregular pressure distribution has been obtained, has been obtained in this grid. And uh, if it has been obtained at all, then we say that there is some kind of a checkerboard distribution. Why checkerboard? Because you can see the values, values are kind of oscillating between a relatively higher value 100 and a relatively smaller value 50. So 150, 150, that's how it goes on. So why do we re refer to a checkerboard? If you remember, checkerboards have blocks having different colors. So you jump from one to the other and you can identify two families of blocks. So it is very similar to that. So that's why we say that this is a kind of a checkerboard pattern. Now, if at all this irregular pressure distribution has been obtained on this grid, can the way the velocities and pressures that have been stored in this manner recognize this pressure irregularity in terms of a pressure gradient that is the question to ask so we just try to compute so we say that the del p del x at the grid point i would then be represented as say the interpolated pressure at i plus half minus interpolated pressure at i minus half the difference by the grid spacing that is that would give you an estimate of the pressure gradient now, if you want to do that, you would actually have to average. So, at i plus half, it has to be averaged based on i and i plus half. So, this is in a linear interpolation. Similarly, you apply another linear interpolation for the i minus half location. And then you take a difference. Now, when you take the difference, you see that p i drops off altogether. You are left with p i plus 1 and p i minus 1. Now, what happens is, p i plus 1 and p i minus 1, if you look at these values once again, they are equal. So, you have lost track of the irregularity in the pressure distribution because the p i, which actually showed a peak, is no longer there in this formula. So, something is going wrong somewhere. 
in terms of calculating the gradient. So, if you have a similar checkerboarding of pressure along the y direction and you try computing the del p del y, this should be del y, then you would come up with a similar problem along the y direction as well. And why are we concerned? Because the Navier-Stokes equation, the two components of momentum contain the pressure gradients along the respective directions. So, if we cannot respond to a highly irregular pressure distribution on a grid like this, how will you be able to percolate the effect of such a pressure distribution on the velocity? You would fail to do that. So, if at all a checkerboarding occurs in this situation, there is no way to eliminate this. Strictly speaking, we should not say there is no way, there are ways of doing a good job even with this situation, but with certain corrections, which we are not going to discuss here, but it is actually possible. There is a famous paper by Rai and Chow, where they have discussed how even with co-location of the variables at the central location of the grid, you can get a consistent pressure gradient calculation. But here, we are interested to pursue it in a different manner with a different approach that is by deploying a staggered grid. So, we will go over to uh, the, the concept of a staggered grid and we will see how uh, it can actually help as a convenient tool to eliminate this problem. So, this is just let us look at the few points we have here on the slide. So, all the discretized gradients are 0 at the nodal points, even though the pressure field exhibits special oscill oscillations in both the directions. And uh, as a result, this non-uniform pressure would give 0 momentum source, because strictly speaking, the pressure gradient lies on the right hand side of the momentum equation. So, it is a source term. And if you are not able to identify the non zero pressure gradient, you are actually adding a zero momentum source. That means, it cannot influence the evolution of the velocity component. So, this behavior is of course, non-physical and we have to do something about it. So, if the velocity components are defined at the scalar grid nodes, the influence of pressure is not properly represented. Now, what is a scalar grid node? So, in the one dimensional grid that we drew earlier, we had shown it at the center of the cell. So, that is referred to as the scalar grid node, because it is a usual practice to store all possible scalars like say pressure, density, temperature at the cell center. Now, based on different kinds of algorithms, the velocity components are either stored there itself at the scalar grid node or at other locations. So, if they are stored at the scalar grid nodes only, we say it is a collocated arrangement. If they are stored at other locations, we say it is a staggered arrangement. So, this is how we distinguish. So, the remedy to the problem that we are not able to identify the pressure gradient properly, we are trying to propose the remedy as deploying a staggered grid and trying to come out of this issue. So, let us see how we do it. We are going to relocate the velocity components and what have we done? The scalar control volume, which is marked in yellow, you can make out that this is the center of the scalar control volume and this square is the, is the scalar control volume. We have located the scalar that is of interest to us pressure at the center and we have shifted the u component of velocity to the right by defining a new control volume, which we are calling as the u control volume. The u control vol volume spans over this length and over this height. So, the height remains the same as the scalar control volume. Only thing is, it shifts towards the right by half cell width, which means now the u velocity component sits at 
the east face of the scalar control volume. I hope you notice that. Similarly, the V component is shifted half grid width upwards towards the northern side along the positive y direction. So, like u is shifted towards positive x direction, the V component control volume is shifted by half cell height towards the y direction. So, V is now defined on the northern face of the scalar control volume. So, this is what we mean by staggering. We are shifting the location of the two velocity components by half cell width or height. This is what we mean by staggering. So, we have relocated them. Now, the question that arises now is how does it help? Are we able to resolve the pressure gradient issue that we identified? Let us try to find out. So, we are concerned about finding the pressure gradient now not at the grid point i like we did in the previous slide, but rather in the shifted location because we want it with respect to the u control volume because del p del x occurs with respect to the u momentum equation. <coughs> Therefore, it would now be computed at i plus half which is nothing but this location in terms of the x direction and j of course remains the same as the scalar control volume. So, we have to get used to this new nomenclature where we have locations written in terms of half cell weights or heights shifted from the basic grid. The basic grid comprises of grid points like i j, i plus 1 j, i minus 1 j or i j plus 1 and so on. But in the staggered grid, we will additionally have grid locations of this kind i plus half, j plus half and so on. Quite often you might say see that one of the indices remains the same as the basic grid. For example, here j remains the same as the basic grid, here i remains the same as the basic grid. It depends on how you have shifted the cell from the scalar cell to relocate it. So, accordingly one of the indices will remain unaltered. Okay. So, if you carefully review this diagram once more, it will become very clear to you how these indices are being defined. Having said that, now let us try to compute del p del x. So, we find that del p del x now is defined as p i plus 1 minus p i, of course, j remains the same, divided by delta x. And if you remember that we had a checkerboarding along the x direction defined as p equal to 100 at i j, p equal to 50 at i plus 1 j and so on. Of course, in the previous case, we just had a one dimensional grid. So, there was no j index. Here we have a two dimensional grid. So, we also have a j index and purposely we have also introduced checkerboarding along the y direction because you see that as you move along y from i j to i j plus 1, it changes from 100 to 50. Right. So, that way you can now figure out that this will be p i plus 1 j will be 50 minus 100 by the grid spacing which is clearly not equal to 0. So, we have averted the issue that we came up with in the previous instance where this was being represented as p i plus 1 j minus p i minus 1 j which was leading to a 0. So, now with this staggering of the momentum control volumes, we have resolved the issue that the grid is not able to identify a non-uniform pressure gradient. So, now with the staggered grid configuration, it is actually able to identify a non-zero pressure gradient. Similarly, if you look at the y direction, the same is true over here. It again gives you something like 50 minus 100 by delta y and that is again not equal to 0. So, this is a very convenient means by which the problem in representing pressure gradient gets solved when you use a staggered grid. On a larger framework, a staggered grid would look like this where you will have a large number of grid points or large number of control volumes represented 
and then you can identify the locations along x and y directions by introducing both the main indices like i i plus 1 as well as the mid indices i plus half i plus 3 by 2 and so on similar things happen along the y direction okay so with this in mind let us try to talk about an algorithm which is a very very popular one in trying to link pressure and velocity on such a staggered grid so we are going to talk about simple algorithm so simple the word simple is of course as you can uh, make out is an abbreviation so it is semi implicit method or pressure linked equations and it is credited to Patankar and Spalding. We are trying to show how the pressure velocity coupling occurs here by taking a steady form of the momentum equations So remember that we are using steady form and this is a good time to recall the general transport equation which we have discussed earlier. And if you can observe carefully, you can find that the transport equation for each velocity component can be derived from the general transport equation. So this is your general transport equation. And uh, each velocity component has a momentum equation corresponding to it. So the transport equation for that is derived from the general transport equation just by replacing the variable phi by either u or v. That is how we do it. Of course, because we are taking a steady form, this is taken as 0. Additionally, we have to remember that in the general transport equation, the source term is phi. In our case, it is a pressure gradient. Of course, we are not considering body forces which would otherwise add on to the source term. So this way, if you look at x momentum equation, it is actually an equation for transport of u. Right. So when you try to write it down uh, carefully, you have to identify that this term u is u into u, this is v into u. So this u comes from the velocity vector this v also comes from the velocity vector that we have written over here and the phi corresponds to u in this equation so this is what is being transported that is a very important connection that we have to understand at this point so accordingly the algorithm will work so keeping this in mind let us try to move on to the next step where we keep the staggered grid diagram in mind which we drew with the pressure or the scalar control volume at the center and the u control volume staggered to the right, the v control volume staggered to the top. Keeping that in mind, let us try to uh, work out the simple algorithm. Of course, we continue with our finite volume formulation like we have been discussing from uh, the previous module of one dimensional advection diffusion equation. So, we try to integrate the u 
momentum equation on the u control volume. So, let us write the double integral over u c v. So, that is the u control volume, right. And then we start integrating all the terms. So, now if you expand each one of these terms, what do you get? Let us make a small sketch over here. So, if this is the scalar control volume, then the u control volume is shifted by half grid spacing to the right. So, you have u i plus half j here and let us mark the faces of the u control volume as say e u on the east, n u on the north, w u on the west and say s u on the south. So, just for convenience I am shading the u control volume, so that you have your focus on this control volume as you try to work out this above equation. So, you can write this as e u square minus u at w u square times delta y. Of course, this is delta x and this is delta y. If you go to the next term, it will be v u at n u minus v u at s u times delta x let us go on to the pressure term. So, that will be P i plus 1 j minus P i j and then on integration this will be delta y. Of course, the minus 1 by rho will remain outside that is always there. When it comes to this term, you will have del u del x at E u minus del u del x at W u times delta y plus del u del y at N u minus del u del y at S u times delta x. So, this whole thing corresponds to the viscous terms on the right hand side. Of course, the mu by rho will act as a coefficient for both these terms. Now, we have to find out how to expand these terms further. Now, remember that when we were discussing about the 1D advection diffusion equation, how did the equation look like? in the differential form, it looked like rho u phi So, this is how it was and we were talking about advection diffusion of the property phi, right. So, how did the advection work? It was like rho u times phi e minus phi w on a control volume like this with the east and the west face here, this is the x direction, right. So, this is how it worked. So, we considered this to be a constant in that case, right. And based on the value of whether, you know, this rho u was greater than 0 or less than 0, we found different strategies of working out phi at east and west faces, right. What were the different strategies? Just to recall, we talked about 
central referencing or linear interpolation, first order of mending, exponential, hybrid, power law, quick and then finally TVD or monotone schemes. We have discussed about so many possible schemes to work out this phi. So this time when I am talking about X momentum equation, I am essentially uh, applying or extending this strategy. Now not to a scalar field phi but to a vector field and I am talking about the vector field in terms of components. So when I say X momentum, I have picked up one of the components U, so I am transporting U. So that is the strategy. So I apply the same principles essentially to this situation. So let us try to figure out how the principle extends. So let us take up the first term E E E U square. How do I do it? Let me write it as say E E U star times U E U. All right. So uh, why do I put a star over here? I need some kind of an estimate over here for E uh, the U at the point E U and then based on that estimate, I am going to use some kind of an interpolation scheme to the next term. That means essentially I am going to figure out whether this is a plus or a minus and then I will apply strategies accordingly to compute the next term U at E U which is multiplied with it. It is similar to what we did over here. That first we figure out what is the sign of rho u. Once we figure that out, then we apply appropriate algorithms to find phi. That is how we are doing it. Okay. So u at e u star would be nothing but the linear interpolation. of neighboring points at which the u's are available. All right. So if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that here in this control volume, if you had extended it, then you would have another u available here, which is u at i plus 3 by 2 j. Why is it 3 by 2? because you step by another grid spacing which extends the grid index by 1. So it is as though you are writing it as i plus half plus 1 because you are going one more grid spacing ahead which means it will give you a i plus 3 by 2. So since you are moving on staggered locations, so you move to a staggered grid point. 3 by 2, right? So that is the idea. So once you do that, you can now realize that why we have written it this way here. We have just linearly interpolated, right? So once we see that, we now have the strategy that if E E U star is greater than 0, then let us say we start with a very simple scheme the first order upwind, then what will be E, what will be the U at the E U point? It will be U i plus half j and if it is less than 0, this will be U i plus 3 by 2 j. Why is it so? Let us go back to the previous slide once more. That means if the U at E U star is positive that means the flow is moving in this direction. If you are applying first order upwind, then the u at the point E u will be assigned this value. It is first order upwind. So it gets the value of u at i plus half j. What happens if the star quantity is negative? Then information should propagate from the right to that point. So then you assign the value u at i plus 3 by 2 j to u at e u. So that is what we have written. That is precisely the strategy. So what is the interpolation we are using here? First order upwind. You can similarly apply all the remaining 
methods that you have learned for interpolating phi in the 1D advection diffusion equation chapters to this situation as well in order to compute the value u at e u. Once you understand this, it is a routine extension to the remaining values that you have to work out, work out in the momentum equation. We will complete our lecture here. Thank you.